Well, here's a scary headline that caught our eye this week in The Guardian. A mega tsunami in the Pacific Northwest. It could be worse than predicted, the study says. Oh, that's great. I know you probably don't want to think about it, neither do I, but as we've told you many times, this could really happen at any time. We tracked down and talked to one of the study's authors there, Sylvain Babot, about what this means. The official numbers for the worst case scenario is about 20 meter high, that's 60 feet or so. Um, this is the, 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 the current state of the art understanding of what will happen. Um, our study shows that there is a potential for a much bigger, much taller waves that will propagate farther inland. Well, how much taller is he talking about? Up to three times as tall. Uh, so if you do the math, one meter is about 3.2 feet. So 60 meters, nearly a wave 200 feet tall. It seems uh, almost um, too big to be true. But um, in Japan, if you remember the giant earthquake that happened in 2011, uh, which was followed by a giant tsunami, the waves uh, and the run-up you know, the flooded area um, was as high as 60 meters. Okay, so these numbers are not uh, impossible. And, um, and another, uh, another important consideration is that when that happened, the Japanese official um, hazard maps did not prepare for that number. Um, and so if you discuss these kind of numbers in 2010, <laughs> Uh, it was deemed unrealistic, too big, uh, and yet it happened. So the question is, what would it take to produce such a high wave? Well, here in the Pacific Northwest, Babo says it all depends on where the earthquake hits, not so much on the intensity of the earthquake. Here's a diagram of a subduction zone like the one off our coast. Look to the top left side. See where it's called the outer wedge? Well, Babo says if the earthquake hits there, that is the sweet spot and we are in for trouble with a large tsunami. And what we found is that um, what controls the tsunami height is where the earthquake happens. If it happens in this wedge that we talked about earlier, then even a tiny earthquake can generate a huge tsunami. And in fact, even a great earthquake, you know, not great in what it does, but in size, if it stays deep and doesn't break this uh, wedge, it doesn't actually create a very large tsunami. So you need giant earthquakes to not only break a, a large fault area, but you also need them to break all the way to the surface and break this wedge. And then when it does, you have this uh, uh, very exceptional tsunami. So the key here is that you can have large tsunamis, even with small earthquakes, if they take place very far offshore. Well, I don't know about you, but this all makes me very tense. Let's bring in our chief meteorologist, Matt Safino, to talk a little more about tsunamis and earthquakes. Matt. Thanks so much, Pat. You know, there's a lot going on here, a lot to impact. That is very, very important research, though. And notice he kept saying that if the earthquake reaches the surface, that's key. And what he means is the surface of the sea floor, because to get a tsunami, it doesn't matter if it's an earthquake or something else. What you need is displacement of water. So you need that earthquake to reach the seafloor to displace the water. That's what causes the wave. Now, just as a reminder, we live in a very geologically active region. Each one of these dots represents an earthquake somewhere in the northwest or the west coast in the last 10 days. And there's a lot of dots. Most of these less than a 2.0 magnitude. Not a big deal. Most of them not offshore, which the earthquake needs to be to generate a tsunami. Back to the map, though, in this new research. This is that wedge area that he's talking about. And one of the things this research says is that if that wedge area is large, well, then there's simply more room for an earthquake that happens deep in the earth to reach the seafloor. Just so happens that the Cascadia subduction zone off our coast here has a very large wedge, one of the top five largest wedges in the world as these things are measured. That's why the risk potentially is higher here for a very, very large earthquake. And if you're wondering what's the biggest tsunami that's ever been recorded on Earth, the wave was about 150 feet tall. It was up off the coast of Alaska. And you know what caused it? Not an earthquake. There was an undersea landslide that did what I said before, displaced the water, generated the wave. So it's all about displacing the water. That's what earthquakes do if they reach 
the seafloor. So that's why these things are very, very complicated uh, in their mechanics. But forecasting them is even more complicated. It's very complex, which is why this is a difficult thing to do. The size, the depth of the earthquake matters, as we just heard. And then the shape of the seafloor, including that wedge, and the shape of the coastline matters as well. If you recall, the coastline in Japan with the tsunami and the earthquake back in 2011, very, very flat. So it's super easy for that seawater to run very, very far inland. Our coast is a lot different. We've got the coast range, which acts as a big barrier. That doesn't mean we wouldn't have issues. We would for sure. But again, it's a different animal here on the West Coast. So all of this new research, what needs to happen next is it needs to be incorporated into the tsunami modeling and the research needs to be studied even further, which I'm sure it will. Pat. Thank you, Matt. I learned something every time you're on. Thanks, Thanks a lot for that.